I'm Dr. Erin Hodges, and I'll be working with you today as you go through your quantitative reasoning section of the GRE. So we have several things that we need to talk about, first of which is the change in the basic structure of the GRE. Uh, at, up to this point in time, you could not use a calculator. Now you can. So you think, oh great, this is going to be a walk. Not necessarily. Uh, what will happen is you can use it but they're going to require fewer basic calculation skills and more logic skills, more problem solving skills. So it does work two ways. So you don't have to memorize uh, square roots of numbers anymore, but you do have to be able to logic out problems quickly. Another thing to realize, this is no longer a, uh, an adaptive test. That is, until recently when you took the computer test, you were not allowed to go back to any previous questions. And what would happen, the questions would get successively harder as you scored well. Now in this version, the new version, you have what's called a multi-stage test. So you can go through and flip back and forth between questions. You can mark them for review and then come back and actually finish them. And then the sections become successively harder rather than individual questions. So that's pretty good. So we have three basic kind of questions that we're going to talk about. We're going to have comparisons, we're going to have problem solving, and we're going to have data interpretation. So what we're going to do today is go through all kind of problems so you can have practice doing all of these. And we're going to spend the most amount of time um, just on the initial structure because that structure is going to be repeated over and over again through the test re without regard to what type of problem it is. All right, so now uh, let's take a look at uh, on page 189 in your book. We're going to talk about percentages and we're going to go to percentage practice set. So we have our percentage practice set on page 189. So let's consider one thing before we actually get into it. Um, when you think about percentages, you're thinking about parts to whole. And one thing that my own students ask me about often, if I have, say, 95%, what is that in terms of decimals? And the formal way of writing that out, of course, is 95% divided by 100%. The percent signs canceled, and you're left with 0 0.95. OK, that's the formal way. Remember when you're working on the GRE, you're working against time. So what you want to do, don't worry about oh, writing all that stuff out on your scratch paper. But what you have to do is just think, oh, OK, that's just going to be 0.95. All right. So let's take a look at the first problem on the set there. And if you read the story, um, let's see where, uh, here it is. If a swe sweater sells for $48 after a 25% markdown, what was its original price? So you can think of x as being the original price. and if it sold for a 25% markdown, then it actually, the $48 represents 75% of the original price. All right? Now you can either do this by calculator, which does take a little while, or you can think, oh wow, 75%. Isn't that 3 fourths x equal to 48? And if you multiply both sides by 4 thirds, you have x equal to 4 thirds times 48, which is 4 times 16, which is 64. OK? And that's your answer, which is answer C is in cat. All right? So that's some of the tricks 
that you have to work with. So sometimes it's easier to take those percentages and turn them into fractions that you're familiar with. And if you do look on page 188 in your book, it gives you all kind of different uh, fractions and percentages to just get in your mind and be familiar with so it's faster. Remember, calculators are good, but calculators take time. Also, you're using their on-screen calculator, not your own. So um, it'll do the basic things that you need to do, but it's not like you're bringing your own, particularly your own graphics calculator in, or your own programmable calculator. You have to do, um, use the options that it has. All right. So let's take a look at the next problem. A hardware store is selling a lawnmower for $300. If a store makes a 25% profit on the sale, what is the store's cost for the lawnmower? Okay, so it makes a 25% profit, so I can think of this as being 1.25 times x equals 300. So here again, oh yeah, let's think about fractions. Isn't it true that 1.25 is 5 fourths? So I'm going to have 5 fourths x is equal to 300. So that means x is equal to 4 fifths times 300. And that's going to give me 4 times 60 or 240. So the original price of the lawnmower is 240, which again is answer C. All right. A retailer marked up the cost of a coat by 20% when she first displayed it in her store. After several weeks, she reduced the selling price of the coat by 25%. If the retailer originally paid $50 for the coat, what will be her loss on the coat at the final price? Now, the key in this one is the loss. It's not the final selling price, but it's the loss. So she paid $50. Okay, mark the code up by 20%. So that's 50 times 1.2. So she tried to sell the coat for $60. All right, then she had $60 times 0.75. That's her 25% markdown. And here again, that's 60 times 3 fourths, and that's going to give me um, 15, sorry, 15 times 3, which is 45. Now that's the final selling price, but how much did she pay for it? She paid 50. She sold it for 45, so you have 50 minus 45, which is 5. That's the loss, and that's answer B. All right. Anybody have any questions so far? Good. Okay. The next thing we're going to look at are simultaneous equations. And this, is, this section starts on page 191 in your book. And there are a couple of different ways that you can solve these. Um, as a rule, um, you're going to solve in the following, well, in the following fashion seems to be the, the easiest or the most straightforward. Suppose I have P plus 2Q equal to 14, and my second equation is 3P plus Q is equal to 12. All right, and I know when I have simultaneous equations, I need to solve for both P and Q. Essentially, it's like a point on the plane. So it has two names, um, a first name and a last name. So on this one, I think, well, if I took that second equation here, if I multiplied that by minus 2 and added the, the first one to the second one, isn't it true that the, the Qs would drop out? So let's rewrite this. I'm going to have the first equation as it stands p plus 2q is equal to 14. Then I'm going to multiply the second equation by minus 2. 
So I'm going to have minus 6p minus 2q is equal to minus 24. Okay. Now, the, one of the tricks on here, make sure you multiply every piece by, in this case, the minus 2. Sometimes people will do the left-hand side and forget the right. So be on the lookout for that. So I have minus 5p is equal to minus 10. And if I divide both sides out by minus, now remember I'm dividing by minus 5, that gives me p is equal to 2. And if you look in the, on that page 191, all they're asking for in this particular case is p, not the whole point. So you have p equal to 2. Okay. So that's pretty straightforward. Now, let's take a look at the simultaneous equations practice set, which starts on page 193. Okay, so I have x plus y equal 8. And y minus x equal minus 2. Well, this one's nice. All you have to do is rearrange, and you're looking for y. So I have x plus y is equal to 8. I can write the second equation as minus x plus y is equal to minus 2. My x's add out to 0. I have 2y equal to 6. And that's y equal to 3. OK? And that's all they were asking for in this particular, in this particular problem. So that one was nice and straightforward. What about uh, the next one? Okay, so you have m minus n equal 5, and 2m plus 3n equal 15. Now notice on this one you have to solve for m plus n. This is kind of sneaky. What I'm going to do is take the second equation, 2m plus 3n equal 15, and multiply the first one by 3. So I'm going to have 3m, just like the company, minus 3n equal 15. So I have 5m equal to 30, and m is equal to 6. So I know that m, which is 6, minus n is equal to 5. Therefore, n has to be equal to 1. So we have m plus, sorry, m, which doesn't want to work, plus n is 6 plus 1, which is equal to 7. OK? Pretty good, huh? All right. Who's ready for the next one? Good. So the third set, which of the ordered pairs, CD, satisfies the simultaneous equation shown? So I have C plus 2D is equal to 6, and I have minus 3C minus 6d equal to negative 18. Well, I look at that and I say, you know what? If I were to take that first equation and multiply it by minus 3, isn't it true that I would get the second equation? Therefore, those are just two representations of the same equation. So I'm just going to look at the first one, the top one. And I have c plus 2d is equal to 6. Fair enough. So now, on this one, I wish there was some magic trick that I could tell you that would, would solve this one. But these, you actually have to pick through them one by one and see if it works. 
So we're going to start out with answer A. So we have negative 2 plus 2 times 4 is equal to 6. Is that true? I have negative 2 plus 8. Is that equal to 6? Yes. So therefore, our answer is A. We were lucky this time it was the first one. OK. Good. All right. The next section is called Symbolism. And this rears its little head in every GRE class that I've ever taken. It looks worse than it is. Starts on page 195. And what you have in this, uh, you've got funny looking symbols instead of multiplying and dividing the way we're used to it. And the only reason that this looks different is because we're used to our the uh, x being multiplied and the plus being added and so on. Now, if we were if we grew up with this stuff, we wouldn't think anything about it. But it just takes a little bit of practice. So if you go to page 195 and you start out with if a diamond b is equal to the square root of a plus b, then you're going to look at 10 diamond 6. But all that is, the first first one is the a, so that's 10, plus the second one, which is b, in this case, which is 6. So you're going to have the square root of 16. And uh, you have non-negative numbers, a and b. So the square root is going to be 4. OK. So that's all there is to it. And that was choice c. All right, now sometimes things get a little more complicated. You, kn you knew it was never going to be just that simple, right? OK, so the next one, you have a triangle. And that means multiply a times 3. So it's going to be 3a. And you have a greater than or equal to. And that means a divided by minus 2. Then what is the value of a greater than or equal to triangle greater than or equal to? So the best way to do this, look where your parentheses are, break them into pieces, and go from there. So let me change the page here. We're going to start with a, excuse me, 8 greater than or equal to. And that's equal to 8 divided by minus 2 which is minus 4. All right. And we take that the answer to that, that is the minus 4 triangle. And that's going to be 3 times minus 4, which is minus 12. And then finally, you're going to have minus 12 greater than or equal to. But isn't that minus 12 divided by minus 2? which is positive 6. OK? So break it out like that and watch for your parentheses. And oh, in that particular uh, set, the answer was E. OK. So let's take a look at the symbolism practice set. Uh, this is, sorry, this is on page 197. OK. If x is greater, excuse me, is not equal to 0, let, let's see, spade x be defined by spade x equal to x minus 1 over x. Then spade of minus 3 is, OK. So I can't draw these little creatures. There, that's what it looks like. So we have spade minus 3. And that's going to be x, so it's minus 3, minus 1 over minus 3. But that's going to be minus 3 plus 1 over 3. 
and that's going to be negative 9 over 3 plus 1 over 3, and that gives me negative 8 thirds. Okay? Now, one other thing that you have to use, make sure you're, you can use your fractions relatively well. In this one, you might be tempted to use a calculator, but notice you don't have things like 0.333, so you have to be able to use your, your fractions. Okay? All right. So let's attack the next problem. In this one, we have R heart S. told you you can't draw these little creatures. R heart S is equal to R times R minus S. Wait, let me change that out a little bit. That's a sick looking S. Kind of sick looking heart too, but we're going to ignore that. Hmm. Equals there. Okay, so we have a four heart, three heart, five. So what I would do in this case, I would use the parentheses, use that grouping in parentheses, solve that one first, then go back and put it together. So I'm going to have three heart, five. So that's going to be 3 times 3 minus 5. And that's going to be 3 times negative 2, which is negative 6. So that's what we have for the last part, the rightmost part. Now I'm going to have 4 heart and the answer from the right, which is negative 6. So that's going to be 4 times 4 minus a minus 6, but that's going to be 4 times 4 plus 6, or 4 times 10, which is 40, which is answer E. Oops, there. All right. So on the third problem, if we have, um, let's see, those are clubs. If C is, excuse me, if C club D is C minus D over C, where C is not equal to zero, then what is the value of 12 club three? All right, so we're gonna have 12, There's club 3, so that's going to be 12 minus 3 over 12, and that's going to be um, equal signs are pretty pathetic this morning, 9 over 12 or 3 fourths. Okay, so that's going to be answer D. Now a quick note, let's just say for argument um, we had this in the problem solving section where you just key in the answer um, and you'll see this when we, a little later uh, when you have a fraction say 9 divided by 12 don't simply well don't spend the time simplifying it you can just put in 9 over 12 and it will take care of it it'll do the automatic simplification simplification so that's just a note for later on okay now we're going to come to my favorite things Triangles. Yay, triangles. And there are many fun and interesting triangles. And we're going to look at a lot of these today. So let's talk about a couple of things um, that you should know. For instance, if you have a right triangle, If you have a right triangle with no, that means you have a 90 degree angle in it. So we all know the Pythagoras theorem, I hope. And 
So there's your right triangle. You have A, B, and C. That's A squared plus B squared equal to C squared. Okay, that's pretty good. That's pretty handy. And you also have special things that we're going to talk about in a minute. One other thing to know about a triangle, its area. And that is one half base times height. So in the picture that I've drawn here, that would actually be one half. Oops, sorry. That should be one half. One half. A times B. All right. And one other thing before we get into the uh, special triangles. When you talk about the perimeter, of a triangle, it's just the total of the lengths of all three sides. So going back to the triangle that I drew on the previous slide, the perimeter of that one would simply be a plus B plus C. All right? Okay. Now some of the special ones that you need to know about, uh, there are triangles. These are right, special right triangles, I should say. And they have the lengths in special ratios so you'll see things like three four five triangles alright what does that mean one side has the length three one side has the length four and the hypotenuse has the length five okay now how can I use this you might think well suppose I have something like this if I have 6 and I have 8, then I know that that hypotenuse must be 10. If I think of this as being, okay, if I have 6 here and then 8, I see, well, I multiplied each of those by 2, so if I multiply the last piece by 2, it must be equal to 10. These come up very often. There's another set like that. It's the 5, 12, uh, 13 triangle. Same kind of thing. Uh, just watch the logic on that, and it'll come out. OK? The next one that is very interesting is your 45 degree, 45, 45, 90 triangle, and its lengths are in the ratio 1, 1, square root of 2. And finally, if you have a 30, 60, 90 degree triangle, you're going to have the lengths in the ratio 1, square root of 3, and 2. OK? So those come up very often. And that's one of those things. Don't waste time using Pythagoras if you know this. Uh, the reason being that you have to sit down and do the squares and the square roots and everything. So it, you're usually better off to do that, to have them memorized. OK, so please do, uh, let's see, it goes from, please do read from pages 199 to 203. And they have all kind of stuff, all kind of uh, pictures and such.
for your special triangles and we're going to do a practice set right now. Okay. So let's take a look at the practice set on page 204, problem 1. So here I'm going to attempt to draw this, thereby guaranteeing it won't work. Okay, so if I have 60 degrees here and 150 degrees there, I want to, let's see, I want to know, I have a B, oh sorry, I did it backwards, a C, and B, I know that A, B is equal to 4, so how long is A, C? All right. So we know, what do we know about um, supplementary angles? Good. Okay. So if I consider this whole angle where C is, isn't it true that it has 180 total degrees? Therefore, I must have 30 degrees right there. So how much is left over in my triangle? Isn't it 90? Yes. So I have a 30, 60, 90 degree triangle. Yay. So I know that the smallest side, the shortest side, is across from the 30 degree. So let's write this down. I have 30, 60, 90. I know the relationship is 1 square root of 3 and 2. So if the smallest one is 4, and I'm actually looking for the largest one, I notice 1 times 4 gave me the 4. So 2 times 4 is going to give me 8. So the answer to this one is C, which is 8. Okay? Now, let's take a look at the next one. So I have the perimeter ABC. So I have A, C, B, and I have 5 and 6. All right, I know that the perimeter is 16. So that means that 16 is equal to 5 plus 6 plus that other side, that is A, B. So how much must that be? That's right, 5. Okay, so then I'm going to, I want to find the area, so what I'm going to do is drop a diagonal there, and what that's going to do is split AC into half, and this is going to give me three Let's uh, in the center. So I have 3 here, I've got 5 as my hypotenuse, so how much must that diagonal be? It must be 4. Alright, so the area is going to be 1 half base times height. And the base, now when you go back and do this, remember it's the base of the whole thing. So the base is 6 times the height is 4, and when I multiply that out, it gives me 12, which is answer D. Good. Okay. Now, the next one, a ladder 20 feet long is placed against a wall. If the distance on the ground from the wall to the ladder is 12 feet, how many feet up the wall does the ladder reach? So let's take a look at this. Now this is one, it's good to draw a picture. So there's my 20 foot ladder. Here's 12 feet. And I'm really interested in knowing what this distance is. Hmm. But this makes me think. Hmm. What does it make me think of? How about 3, 4, and 5? Yes? Okay. 
So if I have 3, 4, and 5, I'll say, all right, I've got 12 here. I've got 20 here. So 4, what did I have to multiply those by? 4. So if I take that middle piece and do 4 times 4, that's going to give me 16. So the height on there will be 16, which is answer C. Now, when you have ones like this, it's good to sketch it out. Remember that you want to do, uh, you want to use your scratch paper. One thing to be aware of, uh, when you get new scratch paper, you have to turn in what you have. So um, what you might want to do is keep it until you're done with a particular section, rather than trying to break up the section. And remember, you can move back and forth. Uh, here's just something that comes up every once in a while. If you have a figure that's an n-gon, you're saying, what's an n-gon? Why can't I write n? OK, that is, it has n sides. Then the total of the interior angles is n minus 2 times 180. So for instance, a triangle is a 3 gone, if you want to think of it like that. So you have 3 mi oops, sorry about that. You have 3 minus 2 times 180, and that's 1 times 180. That's how we get the 180 degrees on the interior of the triangle. OK? So if you have a pentagon or a seven-sided figure, let me rewrite that. You know, just take whatever it happens. If it's a pentagon, take 5 minus. Wow, that doesn't want to write there. Must have a bad spot. There. OK. So take your 5 minus 2. That gives you 3 times 180, which would give you 540. And that does come up periodically, so kind of be aware of that. Commit that to memory. OK, let's take a look at some multiple figures and see what we come up with. And these are a little strange, but we'll have a good time with them. All right, so please take a look on page 210. The best way to do these is just work them out. Again, I wish there were some magic way I could tell you that would always work. That's not always true. You, sometimes you just have to piece them out. Let's see if I can draw this. Okay, so I have E, H, G, F, here's 8, here's 6, here's X, and here's 5. And I want to find the value of X in the figure above. OK, so what I'm going to do is drop a line here. OK, so, hmm. What does this make me think of? Scary thoughts, doesn't it? All right. So what we're going to do is say, all right, I've got the 6 and the 8 there. So it makes me think of 3, 4, and 5 again. So I've got 6 and 8. So the hypotenuse must be 10. I was multiplying everything else by 2, so this is going to be 10. Now, you don't really have angle measurements. Well, let me qualify that. That's not true. You do have an angle measurement at G. It's a right angle. 
So that is indeed a right triangle. And the best way on this one is to find, uh, or excuse me, to use Pythagoras. So you're going to have x squared plus 5 squared is equal to 10 squared. And that's going to be x squared plus 25 is equal to 100, or x squared is equal to 75. Now here again on this one, um, you can't just, use, just plug it into the calculator. You actually have to use uh, work something out. You have to think about this being 75 being the square root of 25 times 3. And that's the square root of 25 times, sorry, that's the times square root of 3. And that gives me x equal to 5 times square root of 3. Okay? So that's how you do it. Again, as I mentioned, there's nothing too interesting in that one. All right. Who's ready to put circles in squares? Yay. So in this one, we have square PQRS is inscribed in the circle. If the area of square PQRS is 4, what is the radius of the circle? So here we have this. And we have P, Q, R, S. And let me just flip my page over here. OK. So I know the area of the square is 4. So that being said, then each side must be 2. So it's going to be 2 here and 2 here and so on. All right, if I draw a diagonal from Q to S, which also is the diagonal of the, uh, excuse me, the diameter of the, the circle, then that's really, if we think about this, you're going to have 1, 1, square root of 2. That's a 45, 45, 90 triangle. And we have 2, 2. So the diagonal is 2 times square root of 2, or the diameter is square root of 2. But we're really looking for the radius, so we need to take that and divide it by 2, because we know that diameter is equal to 2 times radius, yes? So the radius is equal to 2 square root of 2 divided by 2, or just plain square root of 2. And that's going to be answer B. OK. Now. Problem three. This one is probably one of the hardest ones uh, that you'll do. So you have uh, a figure, let's see, with a quarter circle. And we want the perimeter of the shaded area. OK. So we're going to start out with the perimeter of the entire uh, square, first of all, the excuse me, the entire um, rectangle, my fault. OK, uh, the radius is 4, and the perimeter is 20. So we know that this is 4, and this is 4, so the entire top side is 6, and we have, let's see, this is 6 also. Let me split this out. You have 2 here, 
and 4 there, referring to the uh, radius of the circle. Okay, so what we're going to do is add up the left hand side, the small piece with the 2, the top, and then the arc. That's going to give us the perimeter of the shaded in region. Okay, so we already know, the, so this is going to be 6 plus 4 plus 2 plus the arc EC. All right, so how are we going to get that arc? Well, we know that the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. And this is 1 quarter of the circle. So we'll have 1 quarter of that. So it's going to be 1 half pi r. But we know that r is equal to 4, yes? So this is going to be 1 half times pi times 4, or 2 pi. So when we add this up, we're going to have 6 plus 4 plus 2 plus the arc. So you've got 12, and the arc is your 2 pi, so it's 12 plus 2 times pi. Hmm. Let me clean that up a little bit. Okay. Okay, now we're ready for mean, median, mode, and range. And these come up mainly in statistics, but um, they do periodically appear uh, on the GRE, particularly the mean. Uh, so let's take a quick look at this. Uh, on page 214, there's a problem in the middle of the page. Hmm. My symposium is being unruly today. Okay, Nancy shopped at four department stores and spent an average of $80 per store. If she wants to average no more than $70 per store over a total of six stores, what is the most she can average at the two remaining stores? Okay, so if we think about, she's ha she has um, been at four stores and spent $80 per store. So that means up to date she spent a total of $320. All right, or $320 divided by 4 is equal to 80. So now she's going to go to two more stores, but she only wants to have an average of 70 so she's going to have 320 plus 2 times x over 6 is equal to 70. And then if I multiply both sides out by 6, I'm going to get 320 plus 2x is equal to 420. And that's going to be 2x equal to 100 or x equal to 50. So that's the answer which is answer B. So the trick is using that first, this particular step and knowing to get the total. Okay? Now, the median, I'll do a quick example here. Um, the first thing that you have to do is sort the data from smallest to largest. And let's say we have two, three, five, eight, and 12, the median when you have an odd number is the value in the center. So you just go right to the center. All right, now suppose you had 2, 3, 5, 8, 12, and 14. When you have an even number, you're going to go to the two values in the center and average them. So you're going to have 5 plus 8 over 2, which is 13 over 2, which is 6.5. Okay? 
So that's always handy to know. The last thing is the range. And the quick and dirty way to remember that is big one minus small one. So in the data set that I just gave you above, you had 14 as the largest, 2 is the smallest, and 12 is your range. One last measure that comes up is called the mode. And that is the value or values which occur most often. Okay, so if you have two, two, three, four, five, the mode is two. If you have something like two, three, five, eight, and twelve, in that one, there are no repetitions, so there is no mode. You, you would not say that the mode is zero. You would say that there is no mode. All right? And finally, if you have two, two, three, four, five, and five, and twelve, then in that case, you're going to have two modes. You're going to have a mode at two, and another at five. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can have multiple modes. Okay, so let's go to the practice set on page 216. So the only test scores for the students in a certain class are 44, 30, 42, 30, X, 44, and 30. If x equals one of the other scores and is a multiple of 5, what is the mode for the class? Okay, now that one's kind of sneaky. Um, you know that x has to be equal to, the other, to one of the other ones. You also know that it's a multiple of 5. Now if you look at your data set, there's only one multiple of 5, which is 30. Okay, so now when we have our data set, when we order this, you're going to have 30 from the first one, 30, 30, 30, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 values of 30, uh, 42 and 244s. Actually, as soon as you see that you have those four four values of 30, you can quit right there and just say D is 30. Okay? The trick in that one is the multiple of 5, so watch out for that sort of thing. Okay. So in the next one, if half the range of the increasing sequence is equal to its median, what is the median of the sequence? So the range is the largest value, which is 73, minus the smallest value, which is 11, and that gives you 62. So 62 divided by 2 is 31, and there's your median, which is answer B. Okay? Oops. B. All right. So let's take a look at uh, the third problem here. So you have the uh, average or the arithmetic mean of x plus 1, x plus 2, and x plus 3 is equal to 0. So you have x plus 1, x plus 2, and x plus 3 is equal to 0. Sorry, that's divided by 3 because it's the mean. 
So if you multiply both sides by 3, you're going to end up with x plus 1 plus x plus 2 plus x plus 3. You still have 0 on the right-hand side. So you're going to have 3x plus 6 is equal to 0 and 3x is equal to negative 6 and x is equal to negative 2. So the answer to that is A. Good. All right. And the probability, it's pretty straightforward. Um, nothing that you haven't seen before, presumably. So we'll go right to the practice set on page 220. So if 14 women and 10 men are employed in a certain office, what is the probability that one employee picked at random will be a woman? Okay, so we're going to look for the total number of people in the office. So there are 14 women plus 10 men, and that's 24. So you want the probability of selecting a woman, but that would be 14 over 24, and that's going to be 7 over 12. Now in this one, notice, when you've got the ones where you, you're going to select an answer, you must have the reduced fraction. In the ones where you put them in by hand, you don't have to worry about the reduced fraction. We'll be getting to those in a little bit. Okay, so the answer to that one was C. Now we're ready for the next one. A bag contains six red, six green, eight yellow, and five white marbles. You pick one marble at random from the bag. What is the probability that the marble chosen is not green or yellow? Well, there's a couple ways you can think about this. Um, I like to think about it. If it's not green and it's not yellow, then it has to be red or it has to be white. So let's, look, let's get the total first of all. You've got 6 plus 6 plus 8 plus 5, which is 25. So there's 25 total marbles. You want the probability of red or white. And that's going to be the probability of red plus the probability of white. Oops, wrong symbol. Plus the probability of white. Hmm. Must be in that bad spot again. plus the probability of white. And that's going to be 6 over 25 plus 5 over 25, which is 11 over 25, which also is answer C. OK. All right. And let's take a look at the last problem. So you're going to have two coin flips. What is the probability that at least one head will occur? So you might want to just draw yourself out a little diagram. You have heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, tails. And you want the probability of at least one head. So there's four total outcomes. See, this one has one, this one has one, and that one. So three of the four have at least one head, so the answer is three-fourths. Okay. All right, so now we're going to attack chapter 11, which is quantitative comparison. And this starts on page 223. Chapter 11. Okay, now, in quantitative comparison, 
think about this. You need to get these directions kind of memorized in the sense that you know if answer A is larger, then, answer, then you use answer A. If B is larger, you use answer B. If they're equal, you use answer C. And if you can't tell, you use answer D. They give you all kind of um, different uh, approaches to problem solving. Um, read through that. That goes through 223 through 228. And it's easier just to attack problems when we're working on this. But make sure you read through that and see which works better for you. All right, so we're going to go to the practice set on page 229. So, okay, page 229. Problem one, quantity A is x squared plus 2x minus 2 versus x squared plus 2x minus 1. Okay, so the first two terms are going to be the same. So it doesn't matter what these are. They're going to be identical. So essentially, you're comparing minus 2 to minus 1. Which one is larger? B. Okay? So that's all you had to do on that one. Quantity B is is greater. Remember, we're dealing with negative numbers, so quantity B is greater. All right. Problem two. X is equal to 2Y um, and Y is a positive integer. So you have 4 to the 2y versus 2 to the x. OK, I'm going to think of this as being hmm, 4 to the x. The other one is 2 to the x. But isn't it true that 4 is already, oh, let me put this on a page. Hang on. Okay, let's put this back up. Albert, you might want to edit that little part out. So we have 4 to the x versus 2 to the x. And that's going to be 2 squared x versus 2x. So it's 2 to the 2x power versus 2x. Because of the restriction of the positive integer, um, we know that a has to be greater. OK. Now we have p, q, q r, and s are positive numbers. And p, q, r, excuse me. Q, R, and S are positive numbers, and Q, R, S uh, is greater than 12. Okay, so on this one you have Q, R, and S is greater than 12. You're comparing Q, R over 5 versus 3 over S. This one you actually can't tell. Okay, all it's saying is Q, R, and S are positive numbers. So um, this could be 1 times 1 times 12. And you would end up with, uh, say, 1 fifth over 3 fifths. Or you could have something like 4 times 6 uh, times 8 and end up with different numbers. So this one is D. You really can't tell. OK. Now we're going to attack problem four. In triangle XYZ, the measure of ang 
angle X equals the measure of angle Y. And you're going to compare the degree measure of angle Z versus the degree measure of angle X plus degree measure of angle Y. So you have X is equal to Y, and you're comparing that against Z. So, or I should say, you have Z versus X plus Y. Okay, just for argument, suppose X is equal to 35. Then you're going to have 35, then Y is equal to 35. So X plus Y is equal to 70. Therefore, Z would be equal to 120, excuse me, 110. Okay, that's one example. Now suppose X is equal to 45, then Y is equal to 45. So X plus Y is equal to 90, and Z is equal to 90. So you've got a contradiction. In one case, um, A is greater than B, and the second case, A is equal to B. So whenever you have a contradiction and all it takes is one, then that throws you in the answer D territory, that is, you can't tell. All right. So problem five. Uh, we have two squares. And you have the perimeter of square A versus the perimeter of square B versus length of the diagonals, WY to length of PR. So when you think about it, um, Let's say I'm going to call A the length of side A and B. So that's going to be 4A over 4B. Okay. Now, the length of WY, that's the diagonal in A. Well, isn't it true that that's going to be uh, the square root of 2? times A, and similarly, the diagonal in the second square is going to be the square root of B. So if you look at the first one, the 4's cancel, you're left with A over B. If you look in the second one, the square root of 2's cancel, you're left with A over B. So the answer is C, the two quantities are equal. Now, we get into problem, or excuse me, to uh, chapter 12, which is problem solving. And what you're going to see here, um, you have three possibilities to put in answers. You can click on an answer, click on answer. You can select all possible answers. Yeah, one, two. And then the third is you f fill in a box. So you're going to have to watch on these um, and, and how you're required to solve this. The one that's going to be the trickiest is when you switch from clicking on an answer to clicking on all possible answers. So you're going to have to read all the questions, read them all the way through. Okay? Um, so kind of be on the lookout for that. Um, and as I mentioned before a couple times, when you're putting in fractions, it doesn't matter if you have uh, lowest form, it'll take care of it for you. Okay. So there again, if you look at the beginning part of chapter 3, or my fault, chapter 12, 
if you read through the first part and get some problem solving techniques, um, then please go to page 242 and we'll look at the problem set. Okay, so we have r equal to uh, 3s, s equal to 5t, t equal to 2u, and u equal to 0. What is the value of rst over u cubed? The best way to do this one is to break it into little pieces and start putting it together. Um, so I have rst over u cubed. So I know that r is equal to 3s. I know that s is equal to 5t. And I know that t is equal to 2u. So I've got 30 s times t times u over u cubed. And now I'm going to write 30 times, okay, s is equal to 5t and t is equal to 2u. And that's u cubed. So you're going to have, let's see, 150, 300 t times u squared over u cubed. So we have 300 times 2u times u squared over u cubed which is 600 u cubed over u cubed. And before you can say miniature schnauzer, you have 600. OK. And that's answer E. All right. In diagram, in the diagram, L1 is parallel to L2. The measure of angle Q is 40 degrees. What is the sum of the measures of the acute angles shown in the diagrams? Okay. So Q is equal to 40. And we know because of the laws of parallel lines and transversals that Q is equal to S. And F is equal to H. So we have um, two sets of 40 from each. So we have 2 times 40 from the lower set of angles, which is 80, and 2 times 40 from the upper set of angles, which is also 80. So your total is 160. OK? All right. And that is answer, ah, oh, it's just a plug-in, so you just key it in. Okay. So the next one, we're going to talk about penguins and sea lions. Fine beasts indeed. The ratio of sea lions to penguins is 4 to 1, or excuse me, 4 to 11. So you have 4 sea lions to 11 penguins. If there are 84 more penguins than sea lions, then how many sea lions are there? OK. So what we're going to do, essentially, is start plugging in these values. So first of all, uh, I'm going to say, all right, I know my relationship is 4 to 11. If I have 24 penguins, excuse me, 24 sea lions, 
based on this, if 4 times 6 is 24, 11 times 6 is 66, well, that's not 84 more, so we scratch A. So then, 4 sea lions to 11 penguins. If I have 36, okay, that's 9. So I'm going to multiply 11 times 9, which is 99. Is that 84 more than uh, 36? No. So you keep going. I have four sea lions to 11 penguins. So the next one is 4 times 48. I multiplied 4 by um, 12. And if I multiply 11 times 12, I get 132. If I take 132 and subtract out 84, that gives me 48. So the number of sea lions is 48. That one is kind of awkward, but it actually does work. Okay. Problem five. Which of the following are prime numbers between 5 halves and 43 fifths? Uh, indicate all possible answers. Now notice this is all possible. So 5 halves is 2 and a half. 43 fifths is a little over 8. So we're going to have 3, 5, and 7 is our primes. So mark off A, C, and D. All right. Okay. So the figure above is made up of three squares having the same side length. If the perimeter of the figure is 40 units, what is the area in square units? Okay, so the perimeter is 40 units. So how many sides are there? There's two on the bottom. Oh, let me see if I can draw this. Ooh, that's nice. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, pretend those are squares. So you're going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, and those are all actually the same size, allegedly. So if you have eight sides, then a particular side is going to have the length of, or excuse me, have the length of 5. My fault. Did that backwards. Because you're going to have 40 divided by 8. So the length is 5 for any particular side. All right, that being said, um, the area of a square, in this case is 5 squared or 25, you've got three of the figures, so the, area, the total area is 75. Just add them together. Okay. All right. And finally, we're going to do some data interpretation. So that'll be pretty good. Um, I know these are a little bit sneaky, so you have to watch out for them. And I'm glad we got to take a look at this. So um, here again, you're going to have the three kind of questions. That is the select one. select multiples, and enter value. All right, so please turn to page uh, 254 in your book. And you've got uh, questions 1 through 5 are based on the following graphs. 
So you've got total revenues and total profits in the first bar plots. And then you have a pie chart, which is percent of revenue. Okay, so problem one. Approximately how much did total revenues increase from 2004 to 2007? So you have to look at this, and it's total. It's not broken out by the pieces. So the uh, 2004 was about 3. 2007 is about 7.5. So it increased by 4.5 billion, which is answer D. Okay. Now on some of these, you probably will want to use your calculator. For what year, excuse me, for the year in which profits from food related operations increased over the previous year, total revenues were approximately. Okay, so you're going to switch back and forth. The trick in this one is to realize it's asking from two different charts. So profits from food related operations increased. The food related are the clear ones, the unshaded ones. So you want uh, the year 2008, okay? Total revenues were approximately what? E, 8 billion. Okay, in 2008, total profits represented approximately what percent of Megacorp's total revenues? So in 2008, total profits were about 800 million. Now watch your units. So you have 800 million. Three. Okay. And then the. Uh, Total revenues were eight billion as the we saw previously. Three, one, two, three, one, two, and eight. There. Okay, so these are going to cancel, these are going to cancel, the first two will cancel. You have 8 over 80, which is 0.1, which is 10%. Okay, and there again, you might just watch, your, watch the units on that. If you're feeling uneasy about dealing with the zeros, now that one you may want to throw into the calculator. Okay. For the first year in which revenues from non-food related operations surpassed 4.5 billion, total profits were approximately, okay, so in this one, you're looking for non-food related operations. So you're gonna look to see where are they more than, or when it says surpassed, essentially it's greater than or equal to. This is the non-food, so those are the gray ones. You're going to look in the total revenue. And what you want to do is find the one, the first one where it's at least 4.5. And that's going to be the year 2007. It goes from 3 to just about to a little short of 8, so it's going to be more than 4.5. So total profits were approximately... Um, Sorry, 800,000, or excuse me, my fault, 800 million, which is answer E. Sorry, I blanked out on you. Okay, and finally, on problem five, uh, we're going to switch over to the pie chart finally. Uh, in 2009, how many millions of dollars were revenues from frozen food operations? So notice, this is from food-related operations. So you're going to look, first of all, start in the pie chart. Frozen food is 20%. Now the food-related in 2009 is about $3 billion. 
So you'll multiply your 3 billion by 0.2 for your 20%, and that's going to give you $600 million. Now, notice on here, the question is a fill-in, so you need to fill in just 600. Not 600 million, but 600 because it's already in millions of dollars. All right. Thanks, everybody, for your attention, and I hope that you find this helpful. Good luck on your GRE.